One of my favorite short story writers is Patrick McManus, who is an outdoor humorist. And for many, many years, Patrick McManus would regularly write one of the closing humor articles in uh, magazines like Outdoor Life and Field and Stream. It was from this particular book, Never Cry Arp, that I took our short story, Muldoon in Love. And I'm going to read Muldoon in Love. If you'd like to read along with me, or just sit back and enjoy, feel free to listen. Now afterwards, I felt bad for a while about Miss Dietz. But Mom told me to stop fretting about it. She said the problem was Miss Dietz had just been too delicate to teach third grade in our part of the country. Besides being delicate, Miss Dietz must have also been rich. I don't recall ever seeing her wear the same dress two days in a row. To mention the other extreme, Mr. Craw, one of the seventh grade teachers at Delmore Blight Grade School, wore the same suit every day for 30 years. Once, when Mr. Craw was sick, the suit came to school by itself and taught his classes. But only Skip Mosby noticed that Mr. Craw wasn't in the suit. Skip said the suit did a fair job of explaining dangling participles, which turned out to be a kind of South American lizard. I would like to uh, hear the suit's lecture, because at the time I was particularly interested in lizards, but, well, I digress from Mrs. Deeds. No one could understand why a rich and genteel lady like Miss Deeds would want to teach third grade at Delmore Blight. But on the first day of school, there she was, smelling of perfume and money, her auburn hair piled up on top of her head, her spectacles hanging by a cord around her lips, long, slender, delicate neck. We stood there a-gawking at her, scarcely believing our good fortune in getting this beautiful lady as our very own third grade teacher. We boys all fell instantly in love with Miss Dietz, but none more so than my best friend, Crazy Eddie Muldoon. I loved her quite a bit myself at first, but Eddie, oh, Eddie had volunteered to skip recess so he could clean the blackboard erasers, whether they needed cleaning or not. For the first month of school, the third grade must have had the cleanest back blackboard erasers in the entire history of Delmore Blight Grade School. For me, love was one thing, but recess, well, that was quite another. God hadn't intended the two to interfere with each other, but old Crazy Eddie now skipped almost every recess in order to help Miss Dietz with little chores around the classroom. Well, she was depriving me of my best friend's comp company, and bit by bit I began to hate her. I wished Miss Dietz would go away and never come back. Worse yet, in his continuing efforts to prove his love for Miss Dietz, old Eddie started studying. He soon became the champion of our weekly spelling bees. Oh, wonderful, Edward, Miss Dietz would exclaim, when Eddie correctly spelled some stupid word nobody in the entire class would ever re have a reason to use. Then she'd pin a ridiculous little paper star on the front of his shirt, the reward for being the last person still standing in the spelling bee. It disgusted me to think Eddie would do all that work, learning how to spell all those words for nothing more than having Miss Dietz pin a ridiculous little paper star on his shirt. Then one day, Miss Dietz made her fateful error. And now, pupils, she announced, I think it is important for all young ladies and gentlemen to be able to speak in front of groups. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to have show and tell. Each day, one of you will bring one of your more interesting possessions to school. You will show it to the class, and then you will tell us about it. Oh, doesn't that sound like fun? Three-fourths of the class, including myself, cringed in horror. We didn't own any possessions, let alone interesting ones. Miss Dietz looked at me and smiled. Patrick, would you like to be the first one? I put on my thoughtful expression as though mentally sorting through all my fascinating possessions to select just the one with which to enthrall the class. 
My insides, though, churned in terror and embarrassment. What could I possibly bring to show and tell? I mean, the only thing that came to mind was the family post hole digger. I imagined myself standing up in front of the class saying, Yep, this here's my post hole digger. I dig post holes with it. No, no, Miss Dietz probably had a longer speech in mind than that. I glanced around the room. Several hands of the rich kids from town were all waving frantically for attention. Um, um, I need more time, I told Miss Dietz. Yeah, like about 15 years, I thought, but I didn't tell her that. All right, then. Uh, Lester, Miss Dietz said to one of the rich kids, you may be first. Well, the next day, Lester brought his stamp collection to show and tell and he held forth on it for about an hour. An enterprising person could have cut the tedium into blocks and sold it for ice. But Miss Dietz didn't seem to notice. Oh, that's wonderful, Lester, she cried. Oh, I do think stamp collecting is such a rewarding hobby. Thank you very much, Lester, for such a fine and educational presentation. Thank you very much, Lester, for such a fine and educational presentation. And wouldn't you like to clean the blackboard erasers during recess? I glanced over at Crazy Eddie. He was yawning. Eddie had that habit of yawning to conceal his occasional moments of maniacal rage. Good, I thought. At recess, Eddie refused to play. He stood with his hands jammed down into his pockets a watching Lester on the third grade fire escape smugly pounding the blackboard erasers together. Did you ever see anything more boring than that stupid stamp collection of Lester's? He said to me. Oh, I, I think I did once, I said, but it was so boring I kind of forgot what it was. Ha! I gotta come up with something like for show and tell, something really good, Eddie said. Hey, Pat, what do you think about a post hole digger? Lester's stamp collection, however, was merely the beginning of a competition that was to escalate daily as each succeeding rich kid tried to top the one before. There were coin collections, and doll collections, and baseball card collections, and model airplanes powered by their own little engines, and electric trains that could choo-choo your heart out just looking at them and on and on until we'd exhausted the supply of all the rich kids in class. And now we were down to just us country folk, among whom there were no volunteers for show and tell. Miss Dietz thought we were merely a shy. She didn't realize that we really didn't have nothing to show and tell about. Old Rudy Griddle, ordered by Miss Dietz to be the first one of us to make a presentation, shuffled to the front of the class. His violent shaking surrounded him with a kind of a mist of cold sweat. He opened up a battered cigar box and tilted it up so we could see the cont contents. This here's my collection of cigarette butts, he said. I picks him up along the road. You'll notice there ain't any shorter here in an inch. If they's an inch or longer, they's keepers. Some folks say picks up cigarette butts to smoke, but I don't. I just collect them for educational purposes. Thank you. He returned to his desk and sat down. The class all turned to look at Miss Dietz. Her mouth was twisted in revulsions. Suddenly, somebody started clapping. It was crazy Eddie Muldoon. He was applauding. And somebody else called out, Yay! Good job, Rudy! And the rest of us country kids, we joined in, in the applause and the cheering, and we gave Rudy a standing ovation. That Rudy, he deserved it. After all, he had just shown us the way. From now on, show and tell would really be interesting. Farley Carp brought in the skunk hide that he'd tanned himself, and he gave a very interesting talk on the process even admitting that he'd made a few mistakes, but, well, after all, it was the first skunk hide that he'd ever tanned. 
He said he figured from what he'd learned on the first one that the next skunk hide he canned, he probably could cut the smell down by a good 50%, which would be a considerable amount. Bill Stanton brought in his collection of dried wildlife droppings, which he glued to a pine board in a tasteful display, and then he varnished it. It was a fine collection, with each item labeled as to its source. Old Manny Fogg? Why, he'd been unable to think of a single thing to bring to show and tell. He was fortunate enough to cut his foot, though, with a double-bitted axe three days before his presentation, and he was able to come in and unwrap the bandages and show us the wound, which his mother had sh sewed to shut with cat gut leader. It was totally ghastly but also very interesting and educational, too, particularly if you chopped firewood with a double-bit axe, as most of us country kids did. Show and tell had begun to tell on Miss Dietz, though. Her face took on a wan and haunted look, and she became cross and jumpy. Once, I think she went into the cloakroom and cried a bit, because when she returned, her eyes were all red and glassy. I think that was the time Loran Strudel brought in the chicken that all the other Strudel chickens had pecked half the feathers off of. Loran had set the chicken on Miss Deet's desk, and it was using a pointer to explain the phenomena. The chicken, looking pleased to be on leave from the other chickens, but also a little bit excited at being the subject of show and tell, committed a little bit of a small indiscretion right there on top of Miss Deet's desk. Oh. My. God. Miss Deets gasped, Grace going as red as dewberry wine, while we third graders all had a real good laugh. I mean, this, after all, was the first humor introduced into show and tell, and from then on, those of us who still had to do show and tell tried to work a little comedy into our presentations, but nobody quite topped the chicken. So many great things had been brought to show and tell by the other country kids that I had become desperate to find something of equal interest. Finally, I went with my road-killed toad, explaining how it had been flattened by a truck afterwards, and how afterwards I it had dried on the pavement until I came along and peeled it up to save it for posterity. The toad went over fairly well, and I even got a couple of laughs out of it which is about all you can expect out of a dried old toad. Even so, Miss Deets chose not to compliment me on my performance. She just sat there slumped in her chair, fanning herself with a sheet of arithmetic papers. I thought she looked a tad green herself, but, well, that could have been in my imagination. And now only Margaret Fisher and Crazy Eddie were left to do their show-and-tells. I knew Eddie was planning to use several pig organs from a recent butcherin, provided they hadn't spoiled too much by the time he got to use them, but Margaret sort of changed his mind. She brought in a cardboard box and proudly carried it in to the front of the room. Miss Dietz backed off to a far corner, her hands fluttering nervously about her mouth as Margaret pried up the lid of the box, and there inside was a mother cat and four cute baby kittens that stuck out their heads. Everybody ooed and awed, and Miss Deets went over and picked up one of the lovely little kittens and told Margaret what a wonderful idea she'd had had to bring in the kittens, and would Margaret like to clean the blackboard erasers at recess? At recess, Eddie was frantic. I can't use that pig stuff now, he said. I've got to come up with something live that has cute little babies. How about using Henry, I suggested. Well, yeah, I mean, Henry's cute, all right, but, well, he don't have no babies. Hey, I got an idea, I said. I know some things we can use and just say they're his baby. But you better call Henry a girl's name. Well, heck, my Steets won't know the difference. Eddie smiled. I knew he was thinking he'd soon have back his old job of cleaning the blackboard erasers for Miss Deets. And now everybody in third grade counted on Crazy Eddie Muldoon to come up with a spectacular grand finale for our show and tell. An air of great expectation filled the room as Eddie carried a lard pail 
marched up to make his presentation. Even Miss Deet seemed to be looking forward to the event, oh, possibly because it was the last of the show itself, but no doubt also because she expected one of her favorite pupils to come up with something memorable. And with the flair of the natural showman, Eddie deftly flipped off the lid of the lard mail in which he'd punched air holes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he announced, here is Henrietta Muldoon, my pet garter snake. And he held up the writhing Henry. Miss Deet sucked her in her breath. With such force, she stirred papers on desks clear across the room. And that's not all, Crazy Eddie continued, although it was plain from the look on Miss Deet's face that Henry was all by himself excessive. Beaming, Eddie thrust his hand into the pail. Here, ladies and gentlemen, are her babies! And he held up the squirming mass of night crawlers that we had collected the evening before. At first, I thought the sound was a distant wail of a fire siren, a defective one, with a somewhat higher pitch than normal. It rose slowly and steadily in volume, quavering, piercing until it vibrated the glass in the windows and set every hair of every third grader straining at its hair follicles. We were stunned to learn that human vocal cords could produce such an unearthly sound and those of a third grade teacher at that. Mr. Cobb, the principal, came and he led Miss Dietz away and we never did see her again. We heard later that she'd gone back to teach school in the city where all the kids were rich and she could lead a peaceful and productive life. As the door closed behind her, I turned to Eddie and I said, I think you've just cleaned your last blackboard eraser for Miss D. Yeah, Eddie said. I expect you're right. He said it sadly. But then he brightened up. Ah, but you gotta admit, that was one whale of a show and tell.